Today, welcome to the Twilight Zone. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics, where I've noticed posts covering finance and problems with a distinctively Australian flavour. In this week's market update, we'll look at the US first, go across to Europe and in Asia, and finish in Australia. A lot going on, of course. And I would just ask, if you do like this post, please remember to show it by clicking the like. And also, if you haven't subscribed, please do so. It all helps to get the algorithm to work for us. As expected, the Dow snapped a four-week winning streak on Friday as investors paused their bullish bets on stocks amid fears that Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell could push back against the idea of a dovish pivot at his Bankers Fest at Jackson Hole next week. It was a decisive pivot that snapped the longest weekly rally since November as short sellers resurfaced and investors turned cautious after the Federal Reserve officials beat the drum on hiking rates. Treasury yields climbed, while the dollar capped its best week since April 2020. As a result, the S&P 500 index notched its biggest daily decline since June, sending the benchmark to its first weekly loss in five weeks, and the tech-heavy Nasdaq underperformed major benchmarks with growth-related stocks among the hardest hit on Friday. Meanwhile, Wall Street's fear gauge, the volatility index, jumped the most in more than two weeks, back above 20. Note, though, that the expiration of $2 trillion of options, which obliged investors to either roll over existing positions or start new ones, set the stage for a volatile session, as failure to break a key threshold for the S&P 500 around 4,300 appeared to open the door to selling positions. And, of course, the bears pounced again. A basket of the most shorted stocks dropped more than 6%, extending its weekly loss by 12%, and that gave short sellers their best week since March 2020. Against the backdrop of fear and volatility, the dollar marched higher for a third day in a row, and Treasuries fell with a two-year Treasury yield, the most sensitive to policy changes, jumping four basis points. Ahead of the Fed's Jackson Hole gathering next week, officials reiterated their resolve to raise rates to curb tonally high inflation. In comments on Thursday, two voting members of the Federal Open Market Committee, St. Louis' James Bullard and Kansas City's Esther George, stood firm on the need to hike rates, though they diverged on the size of the September move. Bullard on Thursday backed the idea of another 75 basis point rate hike that would take the Fed funds rate to a level that would put significant downward pressure on inflation. But Esther George, however, appeared cautious on larger hikes, saying the central bank has to be very mindful of the lagged impact of its policy decisions on the economy. The Fed speak came just days after the release of the Fed's July meeting minutes, which revealed a firm commitment from the Fed to remain on an aggressive path of policy tightening. And Richmond's Thomas Barkin echoed that same resolve on Friday, noting the risk those efforts could cause a recession. And other Fed officials joined the chorus of a hawkish stance in the run-up to the annual symposium at Jackson Hole on the 25th to the 27th. San Francisco's Mary Daly pushed back against bets for rate cuts before the end of 2023, and Minneapolis's Neil Krasari said that we have an inflation problem right now and that the central bank has to get it down urgently. We think the Fed is likely to put an explanation point on any premature notion that easing is in the cards, and we think they may do that with more hawkish commentary, said Leo Grashi, CIO at BNI Wealth Management. There's been a big change in sentiment, and perhaps a little bit too much complacently here, built in the short term. Fighting the Fed is not a good policy at this juncture, says Jose Torres, senior economist at Interactive Brokers. If you didn't fight the Fed while they were engaging in quantitative easing and they boosted asset prices, why would you fight the Fed now when they're engaged in the opposite? The same way we got a recent violent summer bear rally, you can have those moves exacerbate the other way, particularly as liquidity conditions tightened. It's patently clear that the Fed has inflation reduction as its main aim, even though it acknowledges the knock-on risk of derailing the economy, said Richard Hunter, the head of markets at Interactive Investor International in Leeds. 
Comments from several Fed officials suggest there remains some way to go before victory can be declared on taming inflation. Too right. The pullback in equities this week follows a rally that has propelled the S&P 500 up more than 15% from its mid-June lows amid speculation that the Fed may scale back its aggressive path to rate hikes and a force that contributed to the rally is now showing signs of fatigue with hedge funds dialing down purchases of shares. Markets have been rallying on the back of three assumptions, a moderated recession to come, a Fed pivot and an earnings expansion. From that perspective, this week has been sobering with notably a negative macro news flow, said Florian Alopo, head of macro research at Lombard Audio Asset Management. This week, we have seen a pause in this bear market rally, which has not yet mutated into a turning point. The macro heavy next two weeks should bring about more clarity in this matter. Anyhow, the Dow Jones Industrial Average slipped 0.86% to 3,706. The Nasdaq was down 2.01% to 12,705, and the S&P 500 fell 1.29% to 4,228. In a blow to individual investors, high-flying meme stock Bed Bath & Beyond tumbled more than 40% after Ryan Cohen sold his entire stake in the retailer, and sentiment on the stock was soured further on worries about the company's balance sheet after the housewares retailer reportedly tapped a law firm to explore options to address its debt load. Cryptocurrency-linked stocks tumbled, tracking losses in Bitcoin with Coinbase, Marathon Digital Holdings, MacroStrategy and Riot Blockchain all dropping more than 10% as Bitcoin sank back below 21,000 US. One bright spot in the equity space was Occidental Petroleum, which rallied the most since March on news that Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway won approval from US regulators by as much as 50% in the oil company. But consumer stocks led the move lower, pressurised by a weakness in travel and leisure-related stocks. Carnival Corporation, Royal Caribbean Cruises, Caesars Entertainment and Expedia were some of the biggest laggards in the sector. Other growth sectors of the market, such as tech, were hurt by a fresh climb in Treasury yields, with meta platforms down more than 3%, followed by Google's parent Alphabet and Amazon. The 10-year Treasury was at 2.976, while the 2-year was at 3.238, still inverted in a recession signal. Chip stocks fell nearly 3% to give up the bulk of their gains from a day earlier, as applied materials fell more than 3% despite reporting better-than-expected quarterly results. On the earnings front, Foot Locker rallied 20%, after the sportswear retailer reported quarterly results that topped analysts' expectations and announced that former Ulta Beauty CEO Mary Dillon will replace Richard Johnson as chief executive from September the 1st. Oil tried rallying on talk of a smaller US rate hike for September, and then when oil trades on Fed talk, which is a dollar territory of course and not OPEC bluster, which is fundamentally right for crude, you know something has to give. And it did. West Texas Intermediate, the benchmark for US crude, went up all the way to $92 on Friday before giving back most of it to settle at $89.97. The modest bump at the close also left the US benchmark down around 1.3% on the week. Brent, the London traded global benchmark for crude, settled at $95.78. Brent's session high was $97.84, which if it had held, would have given the global crude benchmark a gain of 1.3% on the day, but for the week, Brent ended up down 1.5%. Crude had rallied earlier in the day on suggestions that the Fed might ease up on its September the 21st rate hike and that the longs between now and then would be opportunistic for risk markets. But the misfortune for oil longs was that the dollar index, which pits the US currency against the euro and five other majors also rose far more than crude, hitting a five-week high of 108.10. The dollar rose on speculation that the Fed would not ease up on supersized rate hikes until it gets a better handle on inflation. That speculation has gained ground since Wednesday's publication of those Fed meeting minutes for July, which did not make a clear indication on what the upcoming rate hike for September 21 would be. You know that when the oil market starts talking about the benefits of Fed moves, 
versus the maneuvers of OPEC or EIA data, then it's time to wonder how much of the fundamentals are holding up the market, said John Cudliffe, partner of New York Energy Hedge Fund, again capital. For what it's worth, $90 WTI is acting like the new $100, he said. In Thursday's session, both WTI and Brent rose almost 4% after the OPEC Secretary General hinted at a production cut by the cartel in September, amid the prospect that Iran's 2015 nuclear deal could be revived in a matter of weeks. Earlier in the week, WTI fell to $85.73, that's its lowest since January 26th, while Brent sank to $91.72, its lowest since February the 16th, on speculation of a new lease of life for the Iran nuclear deal, which could bring an additional 1 million barrels per day or more to the market. And oil was also weighed down since last week by data showing oil refining volumes by top imported China had hit pandemic-era lows. But a hint of OPEC production boosted risk-taking in oil once again. With 13 original members led by Saudi Arabia before its alliance with Russia and nine other oil producers, the extended OPEC Plus group has been raising production over the past year since slashing them from May 2020 in the aftermath of the coronavirus breakout that decimated demand for oil. While this year's production hikes were initially insulated by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which sent crude to 14-year highs of between $130 and $140 a barrel by early March, OPEC Plus has become more vulnerable of late as a market downturn since May has persistently driven prices lower. Thursday's spike in oil was also supported by supporting inventory data from the EIA, or Energy Information Administration. The EIA inventory data for the week ended August the 12th showed US crude stockpiles tumbling by some 7 million barrels due to record high exports and a smaller than usual release from the nation's emergency oil reserve. Exports of U.S. crude hit an all-time high of 5 million barrels last week. The Biden administration, meanwhile, authorised the release of just under 3.5 million barrels from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, compared with its typical weekly releases of 5 to 6 million barrels aimed at bridging supply shortfalls in the market. And elsewhere, gold fell almost 3% for the week, as mixed data raised questions on whether the fledging U.S. recession will deepen or whether the dollar will pick up steam again as the Federal Reserve weighs more outsized rate hikes. The benchmark gold futures contract on New York's COMEX in December settled at $1,761 an ounce, down 0.62% on Friday and for the week December gold lost almost 2.9%. Gold is edging lower again as the dollar continues to see strong support, said Craig Erlum, analyst at online trading platform Onya. The resurgence in the greenback has weighed heavily on the yellow metal, which is already seeing profit taking after reaching $1,800. Until last week, a four week run up had given highs of around that $1,800, and the yellow metal actually peaked at almost $1,825 on August the 10th. This came on the backdrop of softening inflation and other data which signalled that the Fed might be done with supersized rate hikes, a notion which pressurised the dollar lower. But since the start of the week, though, the tide has turned with US weekly job numbers and manufacturing and other data coming in stronger. The dollar's gold contra trade subsequently then began creeping up, and on Friday the dollar index also rose, so the grind lower has started for gold. The question is, how much lower could it get? Now over in Europe, European shares fell on Friday and posted a weekly loss as the highest ever jump in German producer prices in July added to gloom over the economic outlook for the region's biggest economy and rekindled fear the recession. The pan-European stock 600 ended lower, with travel stock leading the declines. Rising energy prices due to the Ukraine war pushed German producer price costs in July to their highest ever increases both year on year and month on month, and energy prices as a whole jumped 105% compared with July 2021. German's DAX lost 1.12%, falling the most amongst its continental peers to 13,544, and the 10-year yield posted their highest in four weeks to 1.2190. The F40 in France fell 0.94% to 6,495, while the London FTSE rose 0.11% to 7,550. 
Inflation in the euro area is likely to exceed the European Central Bank's goal by significantly more than previously expected, according to a survey of financial market experts. A poll by the ZEW Institute in Mainham, Germany, signalled far less optimism on the price outlook than the ECB's own in-house projections, which show the inflation rate dropping to just over its aim of 2% by 2024. The respondents, meanwhile, have continuously revised up their forecasts in recent months. Price growth is seen averaging 7.5% this year before dropping to 4.5% and 3% in 2023 and 2024, according to the report which was published on Friday. ZEW said that most experts cited energy and commodity prices as reasons for their revisions, but 43% also considered the ECB's too expansive monetary policy as driving up inflation pressures. A separate survey of consumer expectations released earlier this month showed a similar discrepancy between households' views and the ECB's. That report put an estimate for price growth in three years at 2.8%. And back in the UK, UK consumer confidence fell to a record low as concerns about a recession increased and soaring inflation tightened to squeeze on household finances. GFK said its gauge of confidence declined three points to minus 44 in August. That's the lowest since records started in 1974. All of its measures fell, with the outlook for personal finances declining the most. A sense of exasperation about the UK's economy is the biggest driver of those findings, said Joe Stanton, Client Strategy Director at GFK. The crisis of confidence will only worsen with the darkening days of autumn and the colder months of winter. The figures reflect a year-long surge in inflation, which hit a four-decade high of 10.1% last month, driving up the cost of everything from food to energy and clothing. And the Bank of England expects price growth to top 13% in the coming months, sharpening the pain for consumers whose real wages are falling at a record pace. Now, over in Asia, markets were mixed, with the Nikkei 225 down slightly to 28,930. The Hang Seng in Hong Kong was up a bit to 19,723 and the Shanghai Composite Index down 0.59% to 3,258. Weakness seems to be the name of the game in the Chinese economy. China will offer special loans through policy banks to ensure projects are delivered to buyers, adding to signs of official support for an industry grappling with a debt crisis and slumping home sales. The help will be extended only to projects facing difficulties with delivery, the official Zhenhai News Agency reported on Friday, citing a statement jointly issued by China's Housing Ministry, Finance Ministry and the People's Bank of China. The move shows regulators are stepping up financing to the nation's embattled real estate sector, which has seen mortgage boycotts by hundreds of thousands of middle-class Chinese still waiting to see the homes they booked as cash-strapped developers struggle to finish construction. The protracted property downturn represents a big drag on growth. The pace of gains in GDP in the second quarter was the slowest since the initial COVID outbreak in New Wuhan, and economists expect full-year expansion could reach just 4% or less this year. With the property market continuing to weigh on growth outlooks, economists have called for more policy stimulus. In response to China's deepening economic slowdown, the People's Bank of China unexpectedly cut interest rates earlier this week, but that step has done little to allay concerns. Earlier this year, China allowed banks and bad debt managers to loosen restrictions on some loans to ease a crash crunch. And in April, the central bank held a meeting with about 20 major banks and asset management firms to help resolve crises at a dozen large real estate firms, including China Evergrande Group. Bank lending to the real estate sector dropped for the first time in 10 years, and the decline could persist. And over in Hong Kong, well, Hong Kong will reopen one of its biggest COVID-19 isolation facilities as case numbers hit the highest in more than four months, putting strains on the hospital system and sparking uncertainty around whether the city can further ease virus policies. Officials will have an additional 200 beds at Asia World Expo starting next week, with 100 healthcare workers to staff the facility. It's part of a new stage of COVID management to alleviate pressure on the healthcare system. Non-emergency services at hospitals will also be further reduced in order to free up beds and manpower. Hong Kong reported 6,445 new cases. That's the highest since the end of March, when the city was exiting a wave of infections that at one stage was the deadliest in the world. 
there are 1,898 COVID patients in hospitals, including 25 serious cases, 26 in critical condition and 10 in intensive care. The increase in daily infections is being fueled by more transmissible Omicron subvariants and while it follows this month's easing of quarantine rules for inbound travellers, imported cases still make up a fraction of the total. Still, it casts uncertainty over whether there will be a further relaxation of measures as Hong Kong seeks to revive its reputation as a global financial hub. Optimism had been building that the city's plan to host a high-level government-sponsored financial forum in November, as well as a rugby tournament in the same month, could become an opportunity for the city to open up. The rising number of cases are likely to be a hurdle in Hong Kong's plans to reopen its borders with mainland China, with discussions last year scuppered by swelling infections in the city. The Hong Kong government is studying whether it can offer quarantine services to local travellers trying to enter China, the Hong Kong Economic Times reported this week. Now down here in Australia, soaring oil and prices have sent ASX coal miners to fresh multi-year highs, lifting Australian shares to a weekly gain. The S&P ASX 200 faded from fresh 10-week highs on Friday to finish little change up 0.02% as investors digested another deluge of earnings updates. The index closed the week up 1.2%, making the fifth week of positive gains. The energy sector won the day, gaining almost 4%, while TPG, Telcom, Fisher & Paykel, Inghams and AGL all tumbled on releasing earnings. Santos added 6.4% to $7.50 in its best day since March, as Whitehaven Coal jumped 6.2% to $7.36 and New Hope rose 4% to $4.93. Largest in the energy sub-index, Woodside Energy firmed 4.1% to $30.50 as oil prices extended a 24-hour rebound. Whitehaven Coal is now trading at a record high, surpassing its previous peak of $7.35 in 2011 as coal prices surge thanks to rising demand as Europe scrambles to seek alternative coal suppliers to Russia. New Hope is trading at its highest level since April 2012. Coal gains were offset by falls in healthcare, real estate and financials. All four big banks traded lower. CBA slipped 1% to $99.95 and ANZ fell 2.04% to 2310. NAB was down 1.59% to $30.92 and Westpac dropped 0.72% to $22.18. Investors savaged TPG Telecom after the telco missed key earnings estimates and reported softer than expected growth in per user revenue. Its shares created 12.4% to close at $5.80. A Newcrest Mining was the star of the materials sector, gaining 3.6% despite booking a fall in net profit. AGL, though, fell for its fifth straight day, off 3.9% and almost 8% over the week. That's the largest weekly decline since mid-September, as underlying profits showed the hit from a turbulent few months in electricity and gas markets. AGL declined to provide guidance for the current financial year, citing multiple uncertainties about the outlook following a halving of benchmark full-year profits. Chicken processor Inghams sunk 9.4%, following a 36% fall in earnings before interest, tax depreciation and amortisation. And Inghams also declined to provide guidance in its results on Friday, in which it identified high input costs such as chicken feed and fuel and persistent supply chain and staffing issues. Earnings fell 14% in the year, ended June 30th. In fact, now roughly half of the S&P ASX 200 companies based on market value, have reported their results, with four out of five delivering earnings in line or better than consensus forecasts, according to Van Eyck. Forward guidance is where the market takes its barometer, and this is where some of the gloss comes off the results, they said. The Australian season seems to be following a similar trajectory to the US reporting season in July, where there were some generally good results, but a tempered forward outlook. While results for the full year ended June 30th have been perhaps pretty solid, reflecting the strength of an economy that was, remembering that up until May at least, this was primed by emergency interest rate settings, stimulus cash and record low unemployment. Of course, that's all changed now. And so the results from companies so far have highlighted some good news. Interest rates and higher prices have not yet appeared to have hurt consumers at this stage, setting up the economy for relatively strong growth for the remainder of 2022, maybe. 
But the bad news is that investors have already started to punish companies that proved vulnerable to rapidly rising raw material and other input costs or have been unwilling to provide profit forecasts in the busiest week yet for full year earnings. Investors remained eagle eyed for any signs of companies that have struggled to pass on higher input costs, with inflation touching 6.1% in the June quarter, well above the 3% upper limit of the RBA. The market also punished those that failed to offer guidance on expected profits for financial year 2023. For example, Amcor, the packaging group, was among the businesses to reveal its vulnerability to higher input costs. Including for raw materials such as aluminium, the company passed on $2.2 billion of cost increases in fiscal year 2022, lifting profit 6% but still warned inflationary pressures would persist. Its shares fell 1.2% following the results on Thursday. Financial year results for BHP, though released on Tuesday, underscored the divergence between price makers, such as commodity groups, that naturally benefit from the lift in the price of raw materials, and price takers, such as the regulated energy retailers AGL and Origin Energy, which must absorb higher coal and gas costs within regulated retail prices. BHP, Australia's largest listed company, posted its second best full year profit and rewarded shareholders with a record $16.3 billion US in dividends, sending its shares climbing through the week. Other companies showed how to effectively pass through rising costs. Treasury Wine Estates was rewarded by shareholders for delivering consistent profits and showing it can manage high input costs by rising prices. The company's shares rose 4% on Thursday when the business released its results, the second best performance for a blue chip on the day. Drinks Giant reported earnings before interest and tax of $524 million, just ahead of analyst estimates, while its earnings margins improved slightly through financial year 2022. Morgan Stanley, which holds an overweight portfolio recommendation on Treasury shares, pointed to encouraging signs the company was working to rein in costs while improving margins in part by increasing prices. And Brambles, the freight and logistics business, was another company to prove its ability to pass on higher costs to customers. The business faced inflation in the cost of timber used for its pallets in the order of US$470 million US dollars for the year, but its steadfast determination to pass on those costs helped it achieve a 14% jump in profit growth in the year ended June 30th. The shares rose 5.1% on Wednesday following the results. But REA Group, the real estate listings business, ComputerShare and Telstra have all each warned about rising costs. The big risk underscored by reporting season so far is that conditions in the 2022 financial year and possibly even in the first six months of 2023 might change rapidly. The view inside Australia's biggest banks, for example, is that although interest rates have risen rapidly, strong household and business savings and the historically low unemployment means consumers are largely shrugging off the jump in the cash rate, which has gone from 0.35% at the start of May to 1.85% this month. Indeed, one of Australia's most senior bankers said the experience from New Zealand, where interest rates hit 3% this week and are widely seen as heading towards 4%, suggests that the spending crunch there might not arrive until December. Well, although this banker is extremely confident of the ability of Australian households to weather what is essentially a normalisation in interest rates, albeit a very rapid one, he is starting to question whether a 3% cash rate in Australia will actually slow the economy in the way the RBA hopes. The challenge for investors is that the optimistic view presented by the profit season probably has a use-by date. Rates will start to bite, spending will come off more materially, and unemployment could even tick higher and, of course, consumer confidence is through the gutter. But the past few weeks have provided few clues, actually, about when this pain will arrive. And back to the US, because the US Federal Reserve may send the markets a hawkish message when global central bankers meet at the Jackson Hole Economic Symposium next week. The highlight will be Fed Chair Jay Powell's speech on Thursday morning. Fed chiefs have in the past used their keynote speech to signal important shifts in monetary policy or a change in their economic outlook. Powell will likely signal that the US central bank will continue to raise interest rates and keep them higher for longer than expected as it fights to bring down the highest inflation in decades. So you could see a major U-turn in market pricing and treasuries particularly. Investors have been too quick to price in the less hawkish outlook, in my view. The Fed will not stop tightening monetary policy anytime soon because despite fears of recession, the US labour market continues to be strong 
Our job openings are hovering near all-time highs, and the unemployment rate is standing near historical lows. According to the St. Louis Fred's database, there are nearly 10.7 million unfilled jobs as of June. That's down from a peak of 11.9 million in March, but up from 9.8 million openings in June 21 and 6.1 million in June 2020. And furthermore, at 3.5%, the unemployment rate is now back to its pre-pandemic level and tied at the lowest rate since 1969. And employers continue to raise wages at a strong pace last month. Average hourly earnings rose 0.5% in July after increasing 0.4% in June. That saw the year-on-year increase surge to 5.2%, adding more fuel to a worrying inflation outlook that gives the Fed enough cushion to stay on its aggressive rate hike path. In fact, I can already picture Powell at Jackson Hole saying that the strong labour market implies that the economy can indeed withstand higher rates. And Fed officials have made it clear that they need to see clear and convincing evidence that price pressures are subsiding before slowing or suspending rate increases. Minutes released last Wednesday from the Fed's July 26-27 board meeting reiterated the sentiment that noting inflation remains unacceptably high. Taking that into account, the US central bank has all the ammunition it needs to continue raising interest rates until it sees CPI come down close to its 2% target. In that case, the truth is the markets are set to a fall and the battle for inflation dominance will likely run for much longer than the markets have been expecting. We truly are now entering the twilight zone. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.